50 years postmenopausal female with no known comorbidity. She was diagnosed with carcinoma left breast in 2014. At the time of presentation, the patient presented with fungating mass in the left upper quadrant uh, and the mass is extending to the axilla and it was a foul smelling and bleeding point was present. Left axilla has a large fixed node mass which was around 4 cm in size and there were multiple nodes also in the same side of the axilla on examination. The core biopsy was done from the lesion and it came out to be an infiltrating ductal carcinoma grade 3 obviously, uh, ERPR positive and HER2 negative. Um, this was initial plan in 2014. Uh, so at that time the plan was uh, tag based chemotherapy neoadjuvant 4 cycle followed by the patient was operated, left uh, modified radical mastectomy with axillary clearance definitely in December 2014. And uh, the findings were something like that. There was residual disease, grade two, tumor size five centimeter, uh, and the skin invol uh, involvement was uh, present. The skeletal muscle was also involved, PNI, LVI both present and six node uh, positive out of seven removed and had extra nodal extension. After this, she completed two more remaining cycles of TAC chemotherapy. So her last chemotherapy was on January 2015. After that, uh, subsequently, she received uh, adjuvant radiotherapy to chest wall, axilla and supraclavicular region. Uh, dose was 50 grade 25 fraction, completed in April 2015. And then the patient was on Letrozole for quite a long time, up to February 2017. The patient was hormone receptor positive, was doing very good on uh, letrozole, and uh, there were no particular symptoms. In March 2017, uh, the patient presented with uh, back pain. So we did a bone scan that showed uh, metastasis in D6 vertebra. Uh, MRI was done at that uh, time and we found the vertebra was unstable. So a decompressive laminectomy was done and some stabilization was also given to D5, 6, 7, this region. The biopsy came out to be metastatic carcinoma. We did a ERPR HER2 status and ERPR came positive like before, but HER2 was weakly positive and DISH test was done, dual HER2, that came out to be a positive. So ER positive breast cancer in uh, after three years, it came out to be a HER2 positive disease, challenging for this lady and challenging for us as well. Uh, as a part of the palliation, we given uh, radiation to that dorsal spine, 30 grain 10 fraction, and the patient was started with uh, Zeloda and Lapatinib. Uh, patient uh, could not afford uh, trastuzumab at that time because of the cost issue. So we considered uh, labatinib and Zeloda. Six cycle uh, received. After that, uh, she was switched to uh, eczema stain, labatinib, and somata. So they again, the bone pain came back after a year. And uh, again, bone scan was done. And that part took uptake. And we changed the uh, treatment. We changed the treatment to Fasplodex and Someta. Again, this is off level because we offer trastuzumab and TDM. Both case, both things were not affordable for the patient. Uh, the, he was doing, she was doing good with Fasplodex and Someta. At the end 2018, December, we off level added palbocyclic targeting the ERPR receptor. So the palbocyclic was given for a year. This entire 2019, uh, the patient re received Fasplodex, Eximastin, and palbocyclic. Quite a combination of everything, not uh, according to the guidelines. So she was doing good in 2019. Uh, PET CT was done because of pain in May 2020. That time it was progressing on the bone, but this time not on the same D6 bone. It was a couple of vertebra. Uh, so again, we planned for NAP paclitaxel based chemotherapy. Uh, HR2 directed therapy cannot be given. She took the NAP packly very well and was a very good response. Again, this is progression 2021 April. This time we could manage to give her trastuzumab along with capsitabin and we started another hormone. We found that tamoxifen was not given to this patient anytime. 
so we give uh, tamoxifen completed six cycles of trastuzumab but did not was not feeling very well uh, she was complaining of uh, pain in the shoulder and the cervical vertebra as well there was a swelling in the uh, back of her neck also so this time her pet ct scan came very bad you can see the throughout the spine uptakes are there and uh, there is a soft tissue mass which was never before it's quite palpable and it take uh, pet uptake and also the vertebras are involved you can see uh, this this lesion was a new lesion ilia crest left side painful and interestingly in his full course from 2014 there was no liver involvement there was no visceral involvement but this is the first time in uh, uh, 2021 the patient presented with this multiple hepatic metastasis so this is my case and uh, what could be the next options dr das do you have access to um or I really should ask, does the patient have access to other drugs financially? As an example, would it be worth sending off a uh, germline test for BRCA1, BRCA2 to see if you have PARP inhibitors like Olaparib? And then similarly, do you have access to and could the patient afford at this point um, HER2-directed therapies like in HER2? We do have access to BRCA tests, but most of the tests we have to send outside, mostly to India. In Bangladesh, a couple of centers are uh, doing, but very less in number. So not a very easy access to BRCA, and it's quite expensive also. Germline testing, uh, not done here. Uh, it has to be done from outside. Expensive, and patients have to carry the cost. Go no government financial support for germline testing as well as BRCA testing. Is that also true for um, tumor testing, for things like foundation medicine or other types of tumor tests that you could have access to? Exactly. Um, financial no assistance. Uh, a patient have to do it out of their pocket. Foundation we can send, but extremely expensive. I think it's unfortunate in this particular instance then, you know, um, I don't know how positive the HER2 ratio was. Um, you know, sometimes we get these very close to equivocal ratios and uh, especially in the setting of originally being HER2 negative, I wonder how much the HER2 is driving this cancer to begin with. I think if you don't have access to um, some of the other therapies, it may be a moot point. Um, but those would be the kind of things that I would be thinking about um, because one, if she has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, the PARP inhibitors are very effective. Um, platinum therapies might be able to be used in that setting with some success as well. And then also in HER2, seems like it has more of an effect on uh, just having the HER2 molecule expressed, not necessarily having to have um, a 3 plus or a HER2 ratio that's really um, definitive. And so many of you are probably aware that, that molecule is being tested on her to one plus and two plus breast cancers. And uh, there's, there's some signal there. So that might be the, the rationale of trying to think about using that molecule if available. I think the, um, if you have availability of another um, CDK4-6 inhibitor, <clears throat> particularly abemaciclib, there are now data suggesting that patients who have progressed on pelvociclib can still gain benefit with abemaciclib and an endocrine therapy. Um, Aricha Barja, who was at the Massachusetts General Hospital, did a retrospective multi-institutional study that was published recently looking at this question. And I've seen some successes with that as well. So for me, if she's really, um, if she has access and she can afford Virzinio or Abemaciclib, that might be the next therapy to consider. Otherwise, I think you'll have to pick a, a standard of care chemotherapy, something like a Rivulin, if that's available. Or if she hasn't had it, I can't remember which chemo she's had. Uh, sir, I know it's very difficult to answer direct question to this uh, issue uh, without evidence. Uh, use of palbocyclib in HER2 positive disease. Sometimes we do that when a patient is ER positive, PR positive, HER2 positive, but uh, cannot afford uh, HER2 directed therapy. There are no direct evidence to use palbocyclib or targeting the ER uh, receptor and give palbocyclib and see result. What do you think about that? Like in this particular case, we know we have to give HER2-directed therapy, but the patient can't. So 
Uh, palmocyclib is available in Bangladesh and it's quite cheap. Patient can afford. Uh, so I, I think that's try. very. I think it's very reasonable. Um, you know the reason why we don't use that is just because it wasn't really studied because it was thought to be a very difficult trial to pull off given the HER2 directed therapy space. But if one looks at one of the original kind of phase one trials of palmocyclib, this was done by Angie Michelle uh, predominantly at the University of Pennsylvania. There were, in fact, two patients who were ER positive, HER2 positive. One seemed like they might have had a partial response to stable disease, but the other patient seemed like they had a very reasonable response. And the uh, bemisiquib, there is some data emerging that in ER positive, HER2 positive, again, with HER2-directed therapy. So that's the caveat that this could also still be uh, an effective regimen. So again, I, I think that's reasonable in the absence of any uh, HER2-directed therapies for availability, um, either commercially and or financially, um, which is also why I suggested if she's progressed on pelvocyclib and you can get a benisiquib, that there are data suggesting that the two are not necessarily cross-resistant. Thank you, sir. Uh, Anjana, when I'm raising hand for a long time, sorry, please proceed. Oh, no, that's okay. So okay. Just, a couple of, yeah, just a couple of comments. So uh, because there was this specific discrepancy between the ERPR and her new from the first time around to the second biopsy, which was done in the, uh, which was, uh, you know, a bone biopsy, uh, I would, and now that she has liver lesions, I mean, if the patient is motivated enough, uh, I would probably ask for an ultrasound guided biopsy of the liver, re-biopsy that and do the ERPR and her new. But having said that, uh, you know, so so if if this is still going to be a her driven tumor, then ideally, maybe, I don't know, do you have access to TDM1? I doubt it, right? Even TDM1 would not be really accessible there, I suppose. I'm not too sure. Uh, TDM1 is here, but uh, it's extremely it's expensive. Okay. That is yeah, also there, expensive, yeah. yeah. But, but like but like Dr. Park said, I guess maybe in terms of uh, options, maybe deroxidicam probably is above TDM1 in terms of, in, in terms of uh, you know, order of preference. And also the abema signal thing. So if, if your if your rebiopsy is still showing an ER ER positive tumor, single agent abema cyclib would definitely be a reasonable option. Now to to allude to your question of palvo cyclib in auto positive diseases, I think there is some phase two data, if I if I may recall, uh, where, where you can combine palvo with trastuzumab in in hormone positive tumors. But uh, you know here obviously. That is an issue with, it, with, with giving them trastuzumab, and hence you're using palbocyclib. And I think, uh, you know, yeah, sometimes you have to tailor your 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 treatments to what is accessible and what is available for the for the patient. Okay. Sure. Yeah. That's thank it. you. Thank you, madam. Rajesh sir, what to you? Uh, uh, Arunanshu, I think this case has been managed well, and uh, both Dr. Ben and Anjana, given their oncology point of view what are medical oncology point of view, the management. I have a question like, uh, what made you choose transtuzumab, capsitabine and tamoxifen, a combination of three, targeted, chemo and hormone, both to, all three to come together? I'm not sure why it was being used. All three together, I'm not sure whether it will have synergic effect or whether it will be detrimental. Actually, the patient was having tamoxifen, and we did not stop that. We just, uh, because in view of the progression, we started capsitabine and uh, trastuzumab. So the tamoxifen she was taking, and we did not stop it. So not very sure. Uh, there, there is not no such regimen also like that. Yeah. Trastuzumab Even cap and tamoxifen. Time, no, you had used two aromatase inhibitors. No, one was fastrodex, exemastine, exemastine. right. We use that. Eczemastine we use, Letro we use, Fastlodex is also used. But all three are combined and given, no? Uh, different, different time, not different, together. Different time, okay, okay. Different, different time. Eczemastine one time, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, Letrozole before that, uh, not together. So I have nothing to add much in this case. Sir, what is your opinion for the bone match? Uh, because we have already given radiation to one place, that is the dorsal region, but there are a lot of uh, places which are very painful, particularly the cervical bone and also the right iliac fossa is there. Uh, it's quite painful, painful bone match definitely can consider RT as a palliation to 
settle it down. Maybe you can try to see whether you can add denosumab because you are given zolotronic acid and it is not helped much. Denosumab right. and right. plus okay. maybe yeah. the liver biopsy to check on ERPR status, repeat status while she is undergoing the radiation so that you don't waste time also. Okay. Thank you, sir. We can think about uh, doing a liver biopsy and check. Mm -hmm. sir. Yeah, I, I think the patient has uh, heavily pre-treated with the, both the hormonal manipulation and also the heart to detect therapy. So <clears throat> patient is now near about 56 years old now. So uh, usually needs to go for the supportive therapy. If you want to go for any uh, active treatment, I think we should start from the newer one. Like, because you have a lot of lesions in the liver, you can have a core biopsy of the liver. You can, uh, you can see whether it is a hormonal receptor positive or it is a HER2 positive. Then you can plan for what are the agents you, you didn't have use actually. If it is a HER2 positive uh, cases uh, from the new additions from the liver, you can, you can add, I think, with a, a HER2 directed therapy like transtuzumab and venerobrin, which has not been used. Or if it is a hormone uh, positive, I think uh, in that case also all the hormone has been used, CDK4 inhibitors, but uh, palbociplicans use the other agent can be uh, can be uh, given at that uh, in that cases because there is no hard and fast rule in this cases metastatic diseases where you can proceed from one to one here yeah, there's so and uh, since there's a, a lot of uh, metastatic lesions there both in the uh, liver and both in the bone uh, we can use the other agent like what we commonly use in Bangladesh, liposomal doxorubicin. I don't know whether the Ben Park or Rajesh has the ideas about that. We commonly sometimes use when all the agent fails, we use the liposomal doxorubicin in some cases. If the patient can tolerate, even we didn't use the venerobin in that cases, actually. So that's my opinion, actually. I agree. I think doxel is a great drug. Um, I just don't know what, what the cost is or availability as well, because I know that a lot of this is driven by financial considerations. Uh, it's cheaper in Bangladesh because the drugs are coming from the uh, neighboring countries. It's um, more, more or less affordable by the patients. Very good option. So, Salim Reza, sir, over to you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Orangsho. So, this lady is the unfortunate lady. She is heavily predetect. Initially, the case was ERPR positive, heart negative. Then from breast, then on the bones, it is ERPR positive, heart to positive, this triple positive breast cancer. So again, the patient developed the liver mats in addition with bone mats. So I fully agreed with our previous speaker to do the core biopsy from the liver whether it is again here pair positive or to positive. Then accordingly, we will, uh, we will start our new treatment. Apart from this, as the patient is not uh, very much uh, rich or affordable, so we may consider the patient put in a pediatric management, radiation therapy to the uh, tender or painful bones. This is my comment.